it's sort of like, I mean, I, I sort of look at it just as an opportunity to reconnect with the, with, with alumni, but I think uh, maybe to a certain extent, uh, based on the fact that we find ourselves in rather extraordinary circumstances, can we all agree that the circumstances are extraordinary? Yeah, okay, pretty much. So we wanted to try and, uh, try and, uh, and, uh, and try and uh, get some kind of a handle or at least bring that into our discussion. Um, I do think it's important to announce to you all that it, we, it just came out on the news about uh, 10 minutes ago that the Mashiach has arrived, but it stopped in Rome first to let the Pope know just out of consideration, and now they're not letting him in the country. So uh, what's going to happen next, we don't know, but at least for, for, we should, we'll, probably, it, we'll, we'll probably be able to get through this year before he gets here, at least. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that most of you have heard at this point that there is like a virus going around. So um, I guess like I, I my, my first approach in these kind of things is to, to, to sort of uh, make sure that everybody understands that as far as we know, the end of the world as we know it has not yet arrived. Right? This, what, what we're going through right now is definitely something that's going to change the world. But uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not the end. Uh, we've certainly seen a lot worse. We've been around, we've been on the planet for quite a long time, and we've seen uh, a lot of things that, uh, that you know, that, uh, that certainly overshadow this in a big way. And even if you're, into, if you're into epidemics, then there's lots of those also. And you see that it goes back all the way. We, we see references to it in Chazal, in the Gemara, we see it in Sukkim, and basically if you've studied ancient history, uh, epidemics have been around since civilization has been around. Um, that's not to say that the situation isn't difficult. It is a difficult situation. It's something that's affecting literally billions of people. It's a big deal. Um, and it's affecting them on many, many different levels. And there are definitely, there are people that are dying from this thing. And there's a lot of people whose parnasa is really in jeopardy, along with the fact that uh, it's really, really a serious disruption in our community life also. So there are many, many different levels where you may find yourself affected by the times that we find ourselves in. I bless you all that you should not have to suffer from any personal losses, either in your family and your extended family. And I bless you all that your parnasa should be either unaffected or if it is affected, it should recover quickly. So we are, you know, we're all together with you on this. Um, and, uh, you know, Amir Sashem will get through that part. But there is, it, it's, you can't help but notice that there are two things that everybody is being affected by in a, very immediate way that you really can't get away from. And in a certain sense, they also, it's, it's something that really has the, has, the, has the possibility, at least the potential to have real lasting effect on us. And in a certain way, they're both opposites. One of the thing is, I mean, all, I mean, many of you, I get to see you with, uh, sitting with your children in these pictures. And I'm assuming one of the reasons why your kids are with you in the pictures is because they're home. Right. It's uh, this has actually in a very unexpected way forced a lot of family time on us, which, um, you know, it's like uh, this is not FaceTime. This is face to face time. And on the other hand, it's also forcing us to funnel much more of our lives through a computer. Or our phones, whatever it is. Right. It's uh, many of us are working from home through our computers. A lot of our socializing out through computers. You're shopping more now on computer than you were. Things that used to be a choice in terms of working through the computer have now become on a certain level a necessity for us. So the, what? OK, yeah, they can't see. The, as far as the family time goes, it really can go one of two ways. Not too surprisingly. China is now reporting a big spike in divorces now that people have finally gotten to come out of their apartments. So sometimes spending a lot of time with your family, you know, isn't necessarily the greatest thing. There's actually a very cute clip that was out for a while of an Israeli woman in a, uh, in a car who was, uh, who was really, really ranting on the fact that, uh, that her two kids were at home and all their homework assignments were on the computer. They only have two computers in the house, and she doesn't get any time with her computer, on and on and on, which makes us realize that, in fact, the homicide rate might go up considerably during the course of this virus, either parents killing their children or adolescents killing their parents. So this family time between the divorces, this kind of thing, it really, 
it could go one way, but it obviously also has the opportunity to really be a wonderful opportunity for bonding with your family, um, realizing that your spouse is actually a human being. Um, it, it obviously requires a tremendous amount of patience and requires a tremendous amount of cleverness to manage having your family in the house, you know, basically all day, every day. But it's also really an opportunity to appreciate who it is that, you know, who you're living with and who you've created your life around. I'm actually will be lucky enough to spend my quarantine with Mrs. Kagan as soon as she finishes the most recent book from Jonathan Rosenblum. Until then, we seem not to be on speaking terms, but I'm hopeful at some point in the near future, she'll finish this rather long book and start talking to me. She, however, is stuck with me in the uh, quarantine, which is an imbalance in our relationship that we've been learning to li live with for many years now. But the reality is that being together with you know, your family is really an opportunity. What? You might be with your parents, right? You might be with, uh, yeah, roommates, children, whoever it is, you're with people that are an important part of your life. And this is really an opportunity to, uh, to really, to really, to engage that, to gauge that. It's, but it's only something that you can really make something out of if you make conscious choice to do it that way, to recognize that it's an opportunity. It's definitely a challenge, but every challenge is an opportunity. If we grasp it that way, then it's an opportunity really to deepen our relationships with people. The fact that we're forced to be living through the computer, on the other hand, seems to be just the opposite. It's not as if, it's not as if, as if we really needed something to really push the extent to which computers are really an ongoing part of our lives. Or what I would say is that the extent to which we're filtering our lives through those computers, they're already uh, really a ubiquitous part of our lives. But the reality is that, th that those computers contribute greatly to what I would describe as the defining characteristic of our time which is that uh, I think what characterizes the age, and when I say the age we're living in, I'm talking the last 2000 years, but it's really becoming sharper and sharper in the world that we're living in, that uh, we live in a time when what it is to be human is something that's both objectified, uh, objectified and denigrated. In other words, our ability to really recognize people as something unique and special is becoming increasingly challenging. We live in the, the de defining characteristic of the exile that we're in now. Those of you, uh, those of you who, who, who were in Madrasa Tehillah, you might remember you had a class called Ramchal. And you might remember that we talked a little bit about Goliot, Golis's exiles, and that we find ourselves today in the Roman exile. What characterizes that uniquely in the historical experience of civilization is that we identify reality with material existence. And as a result of that, it becomes increasingly difficult for us to really identify with the existence of the neshama and to really, uh, to really sense what makes it different. I actually innocently bought what was actually a very good history of science book. I, I am a great lover of science. And I uh, was very surprised to open and read the first line of the book as saying the most important thing that science has taught us about our place in the universe is that we are not special. It doesn't have to be that way. But that does, that is a important, I would say it's an important, it is an important aspect of the way that uh, science relates to reality and the way we're taught to relate to reality. And what's happening is as we become increasingly sort of enmeshed and focused in the physical aspect of our lives, it becomes increasingly difficult for us to recognize or become sensitive to the fact that we have neshama, both in ourselves and other people. And that has a lot to do, that's basically synonymous with the fact that we live in a world where we're really told that we cannot distinguish ourselves from, from apes. The reason why we can't distinguish ourselves from apes is basically because we've lost the ability to really gain that sensitivity to, uh, to what it is that makes us different from animals, which is that we have an Ashram or Tzalem Elohim. Buffering our interactions with other people through computers is something that exacerbates this process and exacerbates this problem. You cannot fully engage the neshama of another person when it's coming through a screen. It's something that's real. It's something that's alive. It's something that's immediate. And it doesn't, seem, it doesn't travel through digital space. So uh, with the fact that we become so habituated and so comfortable with having relationships with people going through a phone or going through a computer screen, what's really happening is we are 
sort of become, we're customizing ourselves to a standard of human interaction that really leaves out uh, something, something very, very special about what it is to be human. As a result of this, what we find is that uh, we find computer simulations and robots also, again, I don't know how much you're into this kind of thing, but we find them increasingly convincing. Um, and actually, we, we're, they're becoming increasingly substitutes for people. And there's two things going on here. One of them is that as our, as our sophistication in manipulating both the, both the software and hardware allows us to mimic better, but it's not just that. It's also that our standard of what a human relationship really looks like is going down because as we connect on increasingly superficial level, as we sort of plumb to more shallow aspects of ourselves in the context of a relationship with other people, so the competition from these uh, simulations become increasingly, uh, increasingly difficult to distinguish. And what's really interesting is what, 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 what they've been finding is that in many situations, even when a person knows it's a computer and knows it's a robot, they actually prefer it to human company. Ms. Kagan and I read a book by uh, uh, sort of what happens when you cross a Jewish mommy with an MIT professor. So what you come out with is somebody named Sherry Turkle, who's a, a sociologist who's done some writing on the sort of effects of technology on human relationships, how it's sort of affecting the way we look at people. She wrote a book not long ago called Alone Together. I think the, the title sort of gives it away to you to a certain extent, but if you're looking to really see just to what extent there's really, the book is already 10 years old, but even at 10 years old, it's actually quite shocking in some of the things that it tells us about we are accepting these things as substitutes for ourselves. We're, we accept these things because our, we ourselves have lost, are, are losing the skill of engaging deeper parts of ourselves in our connections with other people and therefore engaging those deeper parts of the people we're, in, we're, we're having connections with. As our standard goes down, this becomes competition. But that's really where the problem lies, is the fact that, uh, you know, that, uh, that we're becoming increasingly shallow in terms of the, amount of, the, the extent of our humanity that we're really engaging in our life and in our relationships with other people. But if this is the problem, you know, so actually to a certain extent, we could ask like, you know, like, you know, why is it that, why would God give us this situation, which is forcing us to actually increase the, uh, our computer time and how we buffer relations with people through those computers? How are we supposed to make, how do we make sense of that? So it's actually really hard to ignore the timing of this whole thing which is that, I go into more detail, but the, the, most, the most telling one is the point at which this really came to impact us in a really, in a way that we really couldn't ignore was basically last week when in Eretz Yisrael, the whole country was given a lockdown and that was true in a number of major areas in, in the United States also. So Manish Tana last week from, it's, it, it was Parsha Zahodesh. Right? We were just coming into Parsha Zahodesh which is basically the, it's the, concludes the preparation and the transition from Adar to Nisan. In a certain sense, it's almost the introduction to Pesach. It's the beginning of Pesach in a certain way. With Nisan, we are really heading right towards Pesach. Those of you who are mothers, good luck cleaning with your children around. I will put in a little, those of you who are interested, I ran into Rabbi Schwab, I went up to Neve this, 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 this afternoon uh, to pick up some stuff and caught a mincha minion in the dining hall as they were serving schnitzel to the last remaining girls in, in, in the Neve dormitory. But he mentioned to me that he was writing up his classes for Pesach into a written form. They should be finished today or tomorrow. And so if anybody wants, is interested in seeing those, um, it might, it could uh, maybe reduce some of the anxiety levels you have as you face your Pesach cleaning with the specter of doing it with lots of extra hands that think they're helping you. So uh, anybody wants that, if you just send me an email or a WhatsApp, 
I'm happy to uh, send you this thing from Rabbi Shrab, which I hope is in my email box already. Anyway, bottom line is we are moving into Nissan, which is a completely different kind of reality from the one that we are really trained to experience. We're really trained to experience our time is the time is time is time is a big thing. Time is a big deal. Time structures our whole experience of reality. And we are trained to experience time as something that sort of plods relentlessly from nothing to nowhere. It means it's move, it moves forward. It's, an, it's a reactor rather than an actor. Whatever has happened before is what causes what's going to happen afterwards. And it goes on relentlessly this way. That's how we're, have we been trained living in the Western world relate to time. But Nissan begins and this whole Pesach period really begins with the mitzvah verse Chodesh. And we sort of, we finish off Nisan, that preparation for entering into Nisan is the recognition of the significance of this Rosh Chodesh, which is, you know, it's a whole different, gives a whole different cadence to reality when you relate to time through the month rather than through the inexorable movement of time of the year. The whole idea of a month is that time comes to an end and starts again. There's a whole, process of renewal there like it's like the month comes to an end and it's a completely new beginning which means that whatever whatever is going to happen is not necessarily connected to what happened before because things are, are renewed they're starting anew another characteristic of the time of the Chodesh is especially Rosh Chodesh Nisan we're told is the Rosh Chodesh is the beginning of this of this of this whole cycle Rosh Hashanah is the Rosh Hashanah of the Regalim of the Moedim, the whole idea of the Moedim, of the holidays, is a Moed, if you've ever flown on El Al, right, when you're really bored and you pick, pick up the map of the airplane it talk, and you forget to turn on the English, it talks about going to the Ya'ad. The Ya'ad is the goal. So a Moed, the Moedim are the goals. It's like the whole point of a, of a year, which is a year structured by Moedim, by Regalim, is it's going someplace. It's going towards a goal. There's a purpose to which it's moving. There's a famous medrash, the first medrash in Parshish Lech Lecha, which uh, is understood in a number of different ways by the Mepharshim, but it basically is talking about how it is that Avram either came to or developed as a Muna. talks about the idea of he saw the world as a Bira Doleket, which is translated in a number of different ways, but one of the ways that it's translated, I think it's the Sasemis that translates this way, the word Doleket means running after something that uh, he saw the world as a beer delicate that was moving somewhere. And that's how he said, well, if it's going somewhere, it must have a, it must have a master. If the beer is delicate, if the castle is moving somewhere towards something, there must be somebody who's running it. There must be somebody who's in charge. That idea of experiencing time, not as a mere movement, but a movement towards, as if there's a goal to get there, that combined with that idea of experiencing time as there's, there's possibilities are endless because the, 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 the next moment is not merely defined by the previous moment, because at a certain point, at the end of the month, the month ends and a whole brand new one begins, Chodesh, of Chadash. The idea of, of coming into Nisan is entering into a completely different kind of a reality. We're moving towards Pesach. What, is, what really defines Pesach? So the Rambam, when he talks about the, what we're supposed to do when we're sitting at the Seder night, again, hard to imagine, you're sitting there, with, you know, in crowded circumstances, how am I going to clean this house? But you're going to get there, and you're going to be sitting at the Seder, and if you don't fall asleep, you'll be following the story of the Seder, the Sipur, the mitzvah telling over a Sipur, the Rambam, when he defines what that Sipur is all about, what we're obligated to talk about at the Seder, the language of the Rambam is we talk about the Nisim and Niflau Shinasu Lavosena. We talk about the miracles and wonders that our forefathers experienced. Right? We sit down, we think we're, talking about, we're supposed to talk about the story of leaving Egypt. We should mention leaving Egypt. There's no mention of that at all in the Rambam description of the actual mitzvah. We're supposed to talk about the miracles and wonders. The idea there is that, that the essence of what it really means to leave Egypt is not to leave a geographical place, not to leave political oppression, but to leave a vision of reality as a physical place and to recognize that we are living in a larger context which contains that physical world that we're living in. Our, our physical reality is something we're living through, if you want to put it that way. It isn't our reality. It's our way of connecting to reality, something which is higher than that. So the whole idea, what, if you want to, what, when you want to come out from Pesach, is not an understanding of the path, that, the path that we followed, specifically to get out of the ge geographical confines of, of the state of Egypt. 
what we want to come out with that Seder is a deepened appreciation for the fact that we live in a world which is much larger than the physical context which we have direct access to through our senses. One of my favorite examples, which I probably mentioned at some point during the course of your Midrash career, you talked about the fact that the Hebrew term for thing is actually davar, which really means like a word. It's like we see ourselves, we're trained to see ourselves as living in a gigantic place filled with things. But what, the, what Lashon HaKodesh really tells us, it's not a world filled with things. It's a, it's, it's, it's a reality that's filled with words in a conversation spoken by a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Imagine living in the world that way. Take one moment to think of that, just what it would be. Everything is a word in a conversation. It's not just an empty physical reality. There's a larger reality. It's a medium for connection to something beyond this world. As we're going into Nisan, we're going into a time of heightened awareness, or we're invited to come to that heightened awareness of the nature of the reality we're living in. It begins with Rosh Chodesh, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, moving us towards Pesach, and the story of Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, which is leaving physical reality and entering into a, a deeper level of reality, which sounds really nice, but it's actually not so, it's, it seems very, very far away from us, right? It seems very, very far away. And the reason it's far away is because we're really in Adar. We're in the Adar reality. Adar is the reality of the time of the year, which is farthest away from Nisan, right? We may have experienced this amazing awakening and awareness on Nisan, but by the time you get to Adar, which is all the way at the other end of the year, that seems very, very, very far away. And the, the reason Adar is something that really resonates with us a lot because to a certain extent, we are in the Adar of history in that sense. We're in the twilight of history. We don't, we have no idea when the end has come. We don't make, we don't make these kinds of cheshbon. We don't make these calculations. They're irrelevant to us. But one thing is clear that we are in the, we're, we're, we're part of that end game. We're very far away from Sinai at this point. We're very far away from the visceral awareness of the presence of the Kaddish Baruch Hu. We're living in that darkness of that Adar reality. That was that, the Adar is that month. And when Haman threw the lots to try and figure out when he wants to destroy the pe Jewish people, when it came out to Adar, he was thrilled. Adar, that's the month that Moshe Rabbeinu died. Moshe personifies this awareness of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. That was, this is the moment which is farthest away. It's like it's come to an end and he was thrilled. And he was right. But even though he was right, there's always the possibility the, of inverting that reality. The, the deepest darkness is the farthest away from the light and the closest to the light in the sense that if you can turn it around, when you turn darkness around, it turns into the brightest light. That's why the, one of the most important operative terms in the Megillah is vinahapahu. That, 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 that we were faced with a disaster and the whole thing was, I don't know what the best interpretation, the, the translation is, vinahapahu basically means it was inverted, right? Haman was standing over us with all his wealth and all his power. And in a moment, he was hanging on the gallows that he built for Mordechai. And Mordechai was given the house of Haman with all the wealth and power that came along with it. And it was a completely different situation. And it turned over in the blink of the eye it turned over in a moment. Is that, that darkness is a darkness that holds within itself the capability of turning it into this amazing light. But like, how do you do that, right? How are we supposed to do that? Well, it's important to recognize that along with Haman being that person who really personifies that other reality, that reality of the physical world, that person Haman would came along with that exactly what we were speaking about before. Haman was a person who denigrated other human beings. Right, by Yivez Lishloch Yad, but Mordechai Levado. When he's faced with someone who is a Mordechai, the Gadol Adar, the personification of Selim Elokim, who was somebody that Haman could not see anything. By Yivez, it was disgusting to him to even deal with a Mordechai. Right? And the Medrash even tells us not only did he feel that way, but that feeling was not just an incidental aspect of Haman's response to what was going on. He's Bazui ben Bazui. This is his inheritance from his forefather, from Esav. Esav Vayivez also denigrated something. He denigrated the opportunity to be the firstborn. He denigrated the opportunity to be the one who, 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 who oversaw the relation between a Kaddish Baruch Hu and physical reality. He could have had the Bechar, could have been the Kohen, Vayivez. It was of absolutely no value to him whatsoever. And because that was no value to him whatsoever, his descendant Haman is someone who felt that way about other human beings 
I'm Mordechai, by Yivetz. What is this? It's nothing. It's nothing for him. Because he lived, just as, as Ace of himself saw no connection between a Kaddish Baruch who God in the physical world, he lived in the physical reality, so his descendants could not see the uniqueness and the divine spark that lies in them of a human being. So if that's the case, then we understand why we find ourselves in a closed room with our children and our spouses and our parents and our roommates, right? That we find ourselves, what? In ourselves, whatever. It's like, it's a time when we're really pressed. We're given the, we're challenged to live with other people, with, 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 to, to, live, to live with ourselves even. We're challenged to live with, with our humanity. And if we grasp that challenge, that is the opportunity to go beyond this super, superficial engagement of our humanity, which is so characteristic of the age that we're in. It's so interesting to have these two things put together with one another. I'm with people and I'm with my computer. And to a certain extent, we have to make, you have to make a choice. Like where does your primary interest lie right are we going to are we going to facetime or are we going to face to facetime right are we going to really engage the people around us are we going to learn to see are we going to take that moment to really see that there's something special and something unique in our humanity or are we going to are, are we going to are we going to turn to those computers again you have to use the computer i'm not saying you don't use the computer but basically the question is like when this is all over right there's going to be a split when this is all over, which it will be eventually, there's going to be a split. There's going to be those people who, because they were on the computer, they started doing all their shopping, they started shopping for their gro- groceries on the computer, they started doing more of their, their, their connections to people through computers, they're working through their computers, they're going to be those people who are going to be habituated to that, and they're going to go out of this situation having immensely increased their focus on engaging the world, reality, others, themselves through that, through that screen. And there'll be those who were pressed into this small space with humanity and they engage that humanity instead of the computer. And that's basically the choice that we face as we find ourselves in the situation that we're in. You know, we're in Adar, we're just now transitioning from Adar towards Nisan, right? We're headed towards Pesach. Like, what are we going to, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to, are we going to seize this opportunity to do something? Or are we going to let it put us, push us even more towards that superficiality, which is so characteristic of the age that we're in? It just, that there's another thing that would have been just as easy to, to, to talk about now. It also was tempting to talk about, which is that, you know, this engagement with the physical world, so much of the interest in it is because we want to control. We want to control our environment. Right? If you recognize that Kedush Baruch was there, you're dependent on tefillah. If it's just a physical world, you learn to manipulate it, you can manipulate it. Right? That's the temptation of it. And here we come into a situation where, you know, where it's, it's sort of remi- where, where, where all of Western civilization with all its science and capitalism is shaking at its roots from an RNA molecule. You know, it's sort of reminiscent of, of, of Titus when he, when, he, when, he, when, when he challenged the Kedush Baruch to fight him and the Kaddish Baruch Hu attacked him with a mosquito. I'll take the smallest thing I have, and I'll, and, 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 and I'll well, this little RNA molecule has, t- t- has turned everything on its head. It's this sense, the reason why I mention that is because we all know that this addiction to the computers is not good for us, and yet we can't turn away from it, right? Where we, we have this whole society and civilization which is bent on control, and yet we can't control the thing closest to us, which are ourselves. Right? We all know that, 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 that we, are, we, are, we are shallow as icing, is that, that, that's the word? We are, we, are, we are emptying out our humanity through engaging ourselves and the people around us through these computers, and yet we can't turn away from them, right? This is the chance, this is an opportunity, this, this even the event that's going around, uh, uh, that we find ourselves in the middle of, so extraordinary, so unexpected, so unprecedented for all of us, right? It puts us in this strange situation where we're sandwiched between our computers, ourselves, and the people around us. You have to make a choice, which one of those, you know, which one are we going to choose to engage? Which one are we going to delve into? Which one are we going to deepen our connection to as we, uh, and as we, as we move into Nissan, 
this this challenge is really the opportunity to, to be the stepping stone, you know, from 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 a reality of Adar into the new Nisan. Anybody's interested? I, I actually I was in America last year just before Pesach. I gave a shear on a different aspect of this sort of you know how it is that we can learn to engage from this Rosh Chodesh thing, all these Nisan, this is alternate reality that the Pesach is really presented. Anybody's interested in that? You send me an email or WhatsApp. I'm happy to start and send you the link to the video that's here.